Steve and Kathy, I've been praying for you all week. Because you're like in the middle of two different things. Yeah. In one sense, there's real stress, and in the other sense, there's real rejoicing. And so there's, you guys have been caught up in the middle, haven't you? Been praying for you guys all week. Yeah. You know, it's a good thing to know the Lord is with you. That's why I came to church today, because I, I need to get reminded of that fact, you know? How about you? You come to church to get reminded of the fact that the Lord is with you, that you're not alone in this, that you're never alone. I think about that three times in the word. You know that three times in the scriptures? He says this. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So you're never alone. Now, you may feel alone, but you need to know that you're not alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Sing it out. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. I will serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength.
Your love is devoted. Ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the hurricane. And that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Kindness makes us whole. You shoulder our weakness, and your strength becomes our own. Now you're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes. For you will have your bride, free from all her guilt, rid of all her shame. Remember her true name, and that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Oh my goodness, did I need to go to church today? Yeah. Anybody get just a little rattled uh, this week at all? Just a little bit rattled? Or is it just, just little old me that gets rattled by the week? And I think whenever I feel rattled, I can't wait to rejoice with you. If I, you know what, it's, it's like, it's like, it's like gravy on my potatoes. It's like, uh, it's just like, it's like honey on my toast. 
Yeah, it, no, it's like chocolate syrup on my ice cream, bro. Yeah. But to get together with you and, and to praise him, what a glorious thing that is. It just, it just helps so much. Doesn't it help? Doesn't it help? So I am glad you are here. Glad you managed to make it. I'm glad that God is so big and so powerful, he managed to drag you out of bed this morning. Man, that's, so for some of us, that's even more, more than parting the Red Sea, getting, getting some of us out of bed, you know, just like part the covers, man, just get me here. So glad you could make it. So glad you could make it. It's so good to be together, isn't it? All right, why don't you take a second, stand up, turn around, and just congratulate the person next to you for making it. Good morning, Refuge family. Oh, yes, I'm going to get this over with really quick. Very quickly. I know. You know what, Mindy, do you want to go ahead? Rachel's, Miss Rachel's in the back, and Riley can go back into the nursery with Miss Rachel right now. Caden can stay and wait for me. Miss Riley, you want to go with Miss Rachel? There you go, sweetheart go. All right. Why am I going to make this quick? Good morning. Yes, it is my birthday. All right. But let me just move on really, really quickly. No, 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 no. Wait a second. Um, I, I just want to know, um, just by a show of hands, all of the people that Lucia has humiliated over the years, uh, would you just raise your hands? Would you raise your So would you love to just get a little payback? Yeah, yeah, I think there's a bunch of people here that would love to get some payback. And I know before you came, she called me on the phone this morning, just wanted you to know, to warn me not to make a big deal out of this, okay? And uh, she said, don't make a big deal out, because she's, you know, she is that kind of a self-effacing, self-deprecating person. And I told her, you know, okay, so I'm going to leave the fireworks in the car. Uh, I'll, I'll do that, but uh, I've... Are you oh, done yet? Dude. Are you done? You're done yet, right? That, You're that's done. That's really nice. I, <laughs> listen, I do not want to have to retain an attorney, so I'm going to leave that alone. Are you done? No, not yet. I okay. have a few more things. All I'd right. Like no, to let know. me go ahead and make these <laughs> announcements. Just so you know, I've made it half a century plus one. But you know what? There are a few other birthdays that I think are more commendable than mine. 
Where is your wife, George? She's in the bathroom. That's what happens. That's what happens to us. Kevin's birthday was on Friday. So you know what, Kevin, why don't you go ahead and stand up because we're going to humiliate you too. We'll wait on Eva. She's in the, somewhere else. And then Arturo, before I forget, we had a birthday the other last week, didn't we? Arturo. Happy birthday. We're all pointing over here. Who is this man? Tommy, and you're 40. Oh, such a young thing you are. Happy birthday. And Eva, your birthday's on Wednesday. Thursday. So you can't sit down. You can't, you sit, can't down. sit down. You can't sit down. My mother's not here, but it's her birthday this year, too, so uh, this week. So I told her we'd sing to her. Is there anyone else that we're not aware of? Wait, who? What? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Ooh, look at that. Look, she gave you. Oh, oh my dude, gosh. Oh, dude, I think you're going to have to retain an attorney. <laughs> that was not a happy look. It's oh, her anniversary. anniversary. Oh. <laughs> that sigh of relief. So She's like, did I? Too. Am I a year older? Oh, and my now, gosh. And now, Tom, you got to go stand over yeah, next to her. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you yes, have to go over you there. should. Yeah, better get over there. Oh Come on, my she's goodness! She's not supposed to feel stupid alone. Oh. Yeah. Also, the Delucas are not here. They're probably watching live. It's their two-year. Is it their two-year anniversary this year? So they are celebrating that and spending that time together. So we want to congratulate them. I have to tell you that people lie when they say I would not be 20 again. I would. I think they're lying. But I would rather do it all over again. I don't care. I'm all about the, I, you know, I would say, some people would say, if I could do it all over again, I wouldn't be as mischievous or manipulating or such a gangsta. I would just be way better at it. So I just, so welcome to Refuge. <laughs> Monica on Facebook. Oh, Jordy, it's your birthday. No, yes. you got to stand up. You Come on. You got to stand up. Oh, yeah. Happy birthday. Oh, my goodness. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Ten toes and everything going off without a hitch. Lord, that you'd bring this baby into the world, another kid to, to walk with you. God, I pray that you would bless Alex and the whole Zampino family and God, that you would just sustain them, bless them, overwhelm them with your provision, but also with your protection. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys, I think that that is it for me. You guys be blessed, and I will talk to you soon. Children, let's go ahead and head to class. Junior high or high schoolers, you've got David and Gina right there in the back. God bless you guys. The ushers are going to come forward. We'll receive our offering. Jesus, you are strong to say. There's no battle you can win. Stronger even than the grave. We turn to you again. And we lift you up.
Now, if you do not have a Bible, please pick up your hand. One of the ushers will get one to you. Once you have it, would you turn in it for me to the book of Luke? If you haven't been with us before, we have been studying through the book of Luke. We're in Luke chapter 6 this morning. I had dinner last night. Uh, down in Little Italy, and I uh, was meeting with a very, very dear friend of mine, a huge supporter of what the Lord's been doing with you and in this ministry with me. And we have been talking for a long time, and the main subject of what we've been talking about uh, it's been a, a kind of a recurring theme, not the main subject, but a recurring theme, and, it, and it's this. What happens when religion goes wrong? What happens when religion and rules go wrong? I mean, what goes on with that? Today, our look at the life of Jesus is a perfect illustration of how it's supposed to work, on what it's supposed to look like. And when some people have complaints about religion, I get it. I totally understand. They, some people have complaints. They have, have arguments that they, they press toward me, and I totally understand. I'm on a, a, a committee with many of the people in the city, uh, uh, the city attorney, uh, people from the city manager's office, people from the police department, people from the uh, Vista Community Clinic, people who represent the sheriff's department, people who represent uh, the recovery community and all of that. And for some strange reason, they invited me on this committee. I have absolutely no qualifications whatsoever, but they've asked me to come. And, uh, you know, I got to share with everybody, because they, they do a round table, and, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, that kind of thing. And so everybody's like, okay, I graduated Stanford, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, they go through all of the letters after their name, and I'm like, hi, I'm Howard. <laughs> you know, I have, <laughs> what do I say? You know, I feel kind of weird. And, uh, but, you know, and I, I let them know that I was a pastor, and it was, it was immediate, the reaction. You could tell with some of them, it was like, uh, have, do you remember like an old detective movie, like a whodunit? And they say, and the killer is, and then there's this music behind, wee, and everybody kind of looks like this, you know. That's kind of the reaction that I got. But as the meeting well, went on and we talked and we shared some things, and I shared some thoughts with them, uh, the city attorney came up to me afterward and, and said, you know, 
I'm not really religious, okay? But, you know, I appreciate the fact that you're here, and it's, it's a pleasure to meet you. And I thought, wow, that's a victory. And, I, and, I, and this is the other half of it. I'm, I'm like, you're not very religious? Yes, you are. Because I, as far as I'm concerned, all of us are religious in one way or another. Webster defines it this way. A cause, a principle, or a system of beliefs held to with an ardor of faith. In other words, we all have rules. We all need rules. All of us. Rules to live by, principles to guide you. Religion is important, and rules are important. And religion is here to answer some of the hard questions in life, like questions like this. Uh, where did I come from? And why am I here? And where do I go after I leave here? And is there life after death? Religion often gets a bad rap, doesn't it? Really does. And there, there's one really good reason why religion gets a bad rap. And you know the answer. Exactly. It's people. They, it's religious people and their rules. They tend to turn life into two groups. It's, it's them and it's us because of the rules, which is why God became one of us. It's good. God became one of us. I took it directly from the message. It comes from John chapter 1 and verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is the way the message puts it. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. See, Jesus came to put things in perspective and put them in order. That's why he came. When you get things out of order, they do not work. Can I get an amen? amen. Have you ever tried to use a screwdriver as a hammer? Yeah, doesn't work. Just over-caffeinated white people and tweakers get that one. They use, you know, the wrong tool for the, the job. Are you hearing me? I'm sorry. Uh, I had to go there, didn't I? For, I'll give you a for instance. When I was younger, uh, I'm a young married guy. I've got, you know, the little kids. I have three little kids. And in having a family is hard. It is, it is, it's hard to maintain a marriage, and it's hard to raise a family in this world. And so I would go to men's retreats, men's studies. I would go to, you know, special things here and there. And I would hear, uh, you know, maybe typically from a guy like me, I would hear a four or five part message on how I can have a great marriage, how my family can be awesome, how my job can be great, how everything in my life can line up. All I have to do is go uh, apply these rules, uh, apply these principles in my life and put, uh, put these indisputable laws into place and everything will fall into place. Just go to A, apply B, followed with C, end up with D, and there you are at E, and everything will work out. That's until you try it. And I've done this so many times. It doesn't work. I've been to so many studies and listened to so many men give me the principles on how this is going to work, and it never works out the way they, they said it. Are you with me? Why doesn't it work? Go ahead and ask me. That was underwhelming. Ask me again. Why doesn't it work? Be well, I'll tell you why, and thank you for asking. Because there are people in my home. It would work fine if there weren't any people in my home. See, it looks great on paper, and it sounds even more wonderful. But because of the people I have to deal with constantly, it never works. Can I get an amen? amen. This, is ex this would explain perfectly why so many pastors, why so many therapists, 
and counselors have really lousy home lives. I mean, they're client-based or they're the parishioners. Everybody thinks they're wonderful until they go home. And then all bets are off. Real life, oh man, real life refuses to be squeezed into a set of principles. I don't know if you've discovered that yet. I mean, steps are great, but they only take you so far. You try to get a set of rules and regulations and, and, and that's going to manage your life, I think you're in for a very difficult lesson. Which is why legalistic, rule-emphasizing systems, well, you know what they produce? <laughs> in every instance I've ever seen, the leaders are legalistic and they're self-righteous. And the followers are hypocrites. Every time. In a legalistic, rigid system of life, the leaders are legalistic and self-righteous, and the followers are hypocritical. See, the followers are usually in mourning and frustrated because they can't seem to get it right. They keep being told week after week after week, if you really want to love God, you're going to do this. And if you really want to make a great family, you'll do this and apply that and do this. That's what they're told. And instead, they're guilty. So they just hide. <laughs> I learned this managing drug and alcohol recovery group in a church. People from other churches would come to our group. And I would say, well, how's it going, Bob? How are you doing? It's good to see you here tonight. I'm glad you're here and working on what's going on with you. He would say, yes. And I would say, well, where are you from? Well, I'm over from Encinitas. I actually go to Blinkety Blanken Fellowship, and I'm, I'm, an, I'm an elder in the church. Please don't tell anybody. Because that would totally mess up my standing over at the church. And I thought, that's when religious gets it wrong. Right there is the reason why religion gets it wrong. Because the self-righteous, the self-righteous over at Blinkety Blanken Church, uh, they're angry. And they're angry for one reason, because people just don't be, seem to be getting with the program. You can, you can always see it. Self-righteous people are arrogant because they actually believe that the rules they set forth, they actually have themselves fooled into thinking they're doing everything perfect and right. You know, and which is why most families have this dynamic in play in their homes. You have the rule keeper in the home who's angry because they're not following the rules. We've got to maintain the rules. We've got the rules. We've got the rules. And then you've got the grace giver in the family. Grace giver simply says, uh, you know, try to make peace and say, don't worry. Dad will calm down sooner or later. Or don't worry, I'll talk to mom. It just, it depends on how your family works. I, I once was told at a, at a retreat, the answer, and, and this is a classic example of how this doesn't work in a family. Uh, I'm the only male in my family, um, in my immediate family, and I was told at a retreat, the way to maintain peace and order in your family and to bring the whole family together is to have devotions every night. So I was told, have devotions every night. What that meant is dads got to sit down and crack open the Bible, and we're going to do some verses, and we're going to spend some time with Pastor Daddy, and then we're going to pray and move into a time of worship before we go to sleep. And as I began to expound from the scriptures, one of my kids goes, Daddy, Daddy, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is that? And what does that mean? And, and I was like, well, honey, just let me get through this. And Lucia pipes in and says, Howard, j j just stop. Answer the kid's question. And then Rachel pipes in, yeah, Dad, why don't you answer Rachel's question? And before I know it, I've got complete and utter anarchy. And I'm looking at these kids going, shut up. We're going to do devotions now. Stop right now. 
Now wait until I get through this, and we're going to get it done in Jesus' name. Be quiet. See, and here's the, here's, the, here's the thing about religious people. Religious people have weird motives. See, I went into the room because I wanted to create peace and unity. It's not because I wanted to bless my family. I wanted them to grab hold of religion and let religion grab hold of them so that I could at least have a decent evening of rest. Never worked out. See, I'm either going to fight for justice and order, or I'm going to focus on the relationship. Jesus was in a continual tug of war with the religious rulers. Jesus on one side, them on the other, the religious rulers on the other, and guess who was in the middle? People. Exactly. It was the people. Religious leaders had their rules and their regulations, and Jesus, he was worried about responsibilities and relationships. Rules versus people. The balance between the two. You do it all the time. You, when it comes to your finances, you, you realize, hey, I, I'm really tired, but I need to go to work. And so you sacrifice sleep for work. Sometimes you pick up two and some of us three jobs. And we, we'll skip a meal just because we, we've got to pay the bills and we have to go to work. I mean, we're willing to make that sacrifices. Relationships and work. Sometimes with my family, they've been willing to sacrifice so much that I could, so I could do what I do. But then there were times where I had to just sacrifice what I do so that we could have a family. I mean... Life refuses to get squeezed into a set of principles. How about school and social life? Man, is it hard. Sometimes you, you, you just got to say goodbye to all your friends because you got to study. You got to go to school. And sometimes you'll kind of push school out of the way because you have a friend who really needs something. You both... Both have to be sacrificed, don't they? There has to be a balance in both. And Jesus, I want you to hear this. Jesus always respected relationships over religion. And he's God. Doesn't that sound weird? He was infuriated with the religious leaders because to them, rules were everything. I want to take you to a place. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read from it. And it's in Matthew 22. Picking it up in verse 36, you can see it on the screen. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? You know why? Because they always said there was one great ultimate rule, and if you had this rule, everything else would fall into place. So teacher, what's the greatest rule? What's the one rule that we can't forget, that we've got to hang on to, and we don't want to compromise at any case, in any way? And sure, his response is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And at that moment, they are just rejoicing. Yes, that's absolutely true. But then he goes to verse 39. And the second is like it. In other words, the second is attached to it. The second corresponds with it. The second is inextricably connected to it, and it's this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, before they were re could even begin to rejoice over loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, he goes, and. And you could have heard, I'm sure at the moment, a collective groan from every Pharisee, Sadducee, and scribe. On these two commandments... He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Simply stating it, he says, you can't, you can't separate these two. See, all of us, and you know, Christians everywhere love this. We, we kind of, we take Judaism and we Christianize it. So it's Christianized Judaism. And what we do is we say, yes, I love God with all my heart, my soul, and mind. And let me just say, if you can love God with all your heart and soul and mind, there's no way that anybody can see that. 
oh, it's easy to hide that. It's easy to say, oh, I love God with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Don't judge. You know, you can't, you can't see it. But when it comes to loving your neighbors, oh, man. Boy, that one you can see. That one you can see coming a mile away. That one's tangible. It's almost palpable. You can almost taste it. You can almost smell it. Man, when somebody doesn't love their neighbor. And so <laughs> the religious ruler, he, he ends with this question. Well, then who's my neighbor? So define it for me. So it's because there are some people that I really can't stand. And I, I just need some justification here. Jesus and the religious rulers agree on this. They agree on the law of Moses. They agree with the law. They don't struggle with it. Matthew 5, 19, Jesus said, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So where's the balance? Ask me, where's the balance? <laughs> Chapter 6, verse 1. That was all to take you to this place. Now it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields, taking it from Deuteronomy 23, 24, and 25. You could do that. And his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? See, in Exodus 20, in verse 10, that was the, you know, that commandment, that third commandment, that you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And so here they are on the Sabbath, and they're looking at them plucking off heads of grain because they're hungry, rubbing them together and eating the grain. So in their minds, technically, they're breaking the rules because they're harvesting. And Jesus is like, come on, man, they're not harvesting, they're hungry. They're just eating, gosh. So, okay, so that we don't offend the law, they should go hungry, right? I mean, this is, what they, this is the way they think. See, this isn't about what day it is. It isn't even about what law it is. It's about where the need is. Verse 3, then Jesus answering said to them, have you not read this, what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave some of those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. There are three untouchables in Judaism, by the way. You've got Abraham, you've got Moses, and you've got David. Those are the main untouchables. Right on the heels of that would probably be Elijah. But man, you don't mess with those three. And he takes David and he throws David right into their faces. See, David at this moment in the story there in 1 Samuel chapter 21, he's running from the Saul, the king's edict, to hunt him down. He wants to kill him. And there the, the, the priest Ahimelech helped him and, and gave him bread, kind of broke the rules. They were only meant to be for the priest, but he gave him the bread. And so they knew this story. And so Jesus is simply asking them in, in simple way, saying, so you're saying that David was wrong too. And Jesus said something else that was absolutely staggering. It's not here in the book of Luke, but it's in the book of Mark in the 27th verse. And this is what he said right on the heels of that statement. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And I want you to kind of maybe think through this. God didn't make the laws and then make the people he made the people then he made the laws does that kind of ring with you he he made people way before he introduced the law that's i mean it, it, it's pretty straightforward that's almost like saying you know what we need to have kids to pick up all these toys that are laying around here no, you put, it, you put the cart in front of the horse, or behind the horse, not in front of the horse. Even in Galatians 3.17, it says that the law was given 430 years later. God made rules for people, not the other way around. If you ever grew up, which is why, if you ever grew up in a home with a parent that needed all the rules to be kept, you couldn't wait to get out of that house. When you were old enough, you were gone. See, great parents know this. There are times when rules need to be broken, when rules should be broken. I'll never forget, my kids, um, all my kids uh, uh, are 
pretty much type A kids. They're really smart, but they're really uh, scrupulous. They really think about everything, and they take a lot of pressure on themselves. I don't know where they get that from. I'm just saying I don't understand it, but they, they take a lot of pressure on themselves. And in school, it was, uh, it was almost maniacal. They would get their homework, and they would be so overwhelmed with their homework that they wouldn't eat, they wouldn't do it, they would just be on the homework. And, and I would watch the pressure build like a pressure cooker. And I would watch them just begin to start freaking out. You could tell they were, they were getting a little f- frayed around the edges. And I would tell them at, at, at the peak times, it was a couple of times uh, every year, uh, you know, mid-semester when they're freaking out, I would go, kids, tomorrow you're not going to school. That's it. As a matter of fact, not only you're not going to school, but you're going to Disneyland. And they and, and seriously, the, the answer would come back. But Dad, I have so much homework. I mean, seriously, Dad, I got I got so much homework. I can't afford to take the time off. I'm like, don't worry. I'm calling the school. We'll get your homework in advance. I mean, they were so responsible. They were doing their homework in the car on the way to Disneyland. Okay. <laughs> They, I'm not lying. They would, they would do that. They're in the back, you know, writing this stuff out. And so uh, I got in a fight with the principal of the school. Not like a, you know, fist fight. But I got, yeah, exactly. Come on. You know, you know. <laughs> but it was like that in a, in, a, in a major way because the principal was like, well, that's, you can't do that. <laughs> They'll have to receive a zero for the day. <laughs> Sorry. I said, Really? Uh, No, you're going to give them their homework in advance because I'm their dad. And as a matter of fact, I pay money to get them to come here. You're going to take care of my kids. Well, that's just not part of the rules. Well, he wasn't messing with just your ordinary run of the mill hoodlum. Oh, no. I got on the computer. I went to the California Board of Education's website, their rules and regulations. And it is a fact that if a parent feels that they're Their son or their daughter is a little stressed out and needs some time off. They are more than willing to accommodate the request. I highlighted it. I put it in a note. I sent it off to him, and I said, smoke on that, fool. We're going. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, we're going. You know, we're in. And, man, he was was angry because his rules were offended. I don't care about your rules. I care about my kids. And sometimes the rules just got to go. Can I get an amen? Amen. Yeah. Now, uh, it it works on the other way, too. My kids. I've said, you know, hey, Dad, can I go over to... Can I go there? I go, yeah, sure, you can go. And, you know, I'm just thinking, ah, everything's fine until I look into it. You know, and, and every parent knows this. You can... You, 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 you do this. I mean, I, I, I have what they call the five W's. You know, who, what, where, when, why. You know? And I, I went into the five W's. It was like, you know, I, I think it was probably Lucia said, you sure you want to, you gave him the green light on that. You sure? Okay, well, let me look into it. We made some calls. And I said, well, kids, uh, you're going to hate me. You're going to be really angry with me, but that's okay. Um, I understand completely your feelings, but you can't go. But dad. You're going back on your word, and you know, you don't, once you say yes, I mean, you make a promise. Well, I'm sorry to offend you, but I'm going back on my own rule. I'm going to break my rule. You can't go. Well, why can't I go? Because I know where you're going, and I don't like where you're going. As a matter of fact, I especially don't like where you're going because I know who you're going with, and I don't like them either. <laughs> so you're just going to, you know, I'm sorry, but we're going to offend the rules. And, 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 and I guess the, the whole bottom line of this is this. You can have a home where there's a place for everything and everything is neatly put away and in its place and you can be all alone. Or you can have a home filled with people who love you and you love them and it is chaos. That's just how life works. People are uncontrollable. You just can't. Which is why verse 5, he said to them, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, there's a greater than David here to meet needs. And God is, from Warren Wearsby's pen to your ears, 
God is more concerned about meeting human needs than he is about protecting religious rules. Period. In Habakkuk chapter 6, he, the, the prophet writes these words, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. He doesn't care what you bring. And you know, and here's a sad truth. Some of you have had a really lousy week. And I don't, when I say really lousy week, I'm not saying that, you know, you've had a lot of bad breaks this week. No, I'm saying that you've been really lousy. Like, you've been really messing up. Like, it's been a foul week. I mean, there have been foul things said and done, all kinds of things. And you, you go, you know what? I've had a bad week. I got to go to church. I better get myself right into church because I've had a bad week. And so here you are and you go, God, here I am. I know I've had a bad week, but it's Sunday and I'm here. It's good, isn't it? I'm glad to be here, and I know you're glad that I'm here. God, hello. I've had a bad week, but it's all good now, isn't it? No. No, there's more to it than that. Look at verse 6. Then it happened on another Sabbath also that he entered the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. By the way, Oftentimes, anybody who was handicapped back in this day only spoke of how the world had been fallen, how there was sickness and there were things that were wrong with people. And so oftentimes what they had done is they'd taken handicapped people, unlike today, people with disabilities, they would put them in the back instead of the front. Like you go to the theater now and it's in the front. They have disability sections all over the place. And I love that. We're more compassionate than we were then. But this time he walks into a synagogue and there is somebody with a withered hand in front. Now, I don't know about you, but I smell a setup. In chapter 4, he's already healed somebody on the Sabbath once and they were a little bit irked about it. So in verse 7, so the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. So they're sitting there, they're watching him. They're looking at the man, they're looking at Jesus, looking at the man, looking at Jesus, looking at the man, looking at Jesus, looking at the man. Back and forth. It's like Wimbledon on steroids. Verse 8. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man who had the withered hand, Arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to destroy? In Mark chapter 3 and verse 4, after the, after the question came out, it says this, that they all remained silent, didn't say a word. And when he had looked around at them, and I love how the Bible puts this, and you, you, you really got to look into this. It says, and so he asked, what's it better, to, to kill or to give life, to heal on the Sabbath? What is better? And he looked at all of them, and I don't think it was like, no, I think it was more like this. It was like the fifth face on Mount Rushmore. He wanted them to know that he wasn't a bit amused by the ruse. He knew their thoughts, verse 8. And said to the man who had the withered hand, Arise and stand here. He rose and stood. Then Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or destroy? And when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. They were convinced at this moment he had to go. Now backing up to Matthew 22, to what I gave you before, and we're, we're going home at this. We're ending right here, and it's this. The religious ruler asked him, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it, connected to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I want to remind you 
that on top of all the rules and on top of all the regulations, on top of every ounce of guilt that you have ever dragged into a place like this, on top of all of those things, Jesus hung on a cross. He hung on that cross, not for rules, but for rule breakers, okay? He hung on that cross, not for religion, but for a relationship. He hung on that cross not for principles, but for people. He hung on that cross not for law, but for love. By the way, he hung on that cross not for sin, but for sinners. That's why he went. And, and, and as, if you look around the room, everyone you see around you has is now defined by the way Jesus sees you from that cross, from that cruel Roman cross. Do you think that when he was hanging on that cross, when he was up there hanging on that cross, that he was thinking, oh great, now all the laws are being fulfilled? Not even a blip on the radar, folks. No, he was thinking about you. He was thinking about the fact that you were in trouble and that the rules were never going to work for you. He was thinking about the fact that the law was going to crush you and ruin your life. And it would lie in every opportunity. It would lie in the way of every opportunity that you might ever be able to have. And he was simply trying to remove every obstacle from your life by love. He was thinking about you. And he was thinking about the person seated next to you. He was thinking about the person on your left, and he was thinking about the person on your right. He was thinking about the person on the left politically around you, and, and the person on the right politically about you, around you. He was thinking about the person who's not white. He was thinking about the person whose ethnicity and his race, they're different than yours. He was thinking about somebody who's not in the same social strata as you are in. And he was thinking about your social strata too. He was thinking about the same economic place that you're in, that they're in, that we're all in. He was thinking about not simply that immoral person. He was thinking about the immoral person over there. And he was thinking about the moral person. He died on a cross for all people. And, and here's, here's the kicker in this whole story. We're talking about laws. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about Pharisees. But there's one person we skipped over who is the, 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 if anything, he was the reason for all of this. The one person who was the reason for all of this was the guy with the withered hand. And this is why he was angry. It was because... Somebody with a, with a disability is not the punchline to the end of the joke. And they're not the point of the story. They're people. They're people. And so you, you can't imagine the kind of pressure that must have been for this guy with a with disability, for Jesus to stand up in synagogue and say, Stand up, come here. Every eye is on Jesus, and now every eye is on Jesus and him. And if you're a disabled person, the last thing you want people to see is you for your disability. You want them to see you. They, they don't want you to know them as the man in the wheelchair or the man with the crutch or the girl with the smaller hand and the, you know, the bigger hand. That one eye doesn't want you to be, they don't want to be known that way. They want to be known as like a person. And so, and, and, then, and then the killer of all of this, while everybody's looking at him, while everybody's looking at him, he says, now what I want you to do is just stretch forth your hand. He asked him to do the impossible. He asked him to do the unthinkable. Stretch. Have you ever met somebody who has a, a dis disability? Like maybe a, 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 an arm or a hand or a leg. Do you ever notice how they... They never prominently bring it out. You ever notice that? They always, you know, you, you don't go, hey, how's it going? They come out with the, you know, with the ear, you know, hey, how are you doing? You know, they, they don't do that. They'll go with the right. They'll go with the one that works. You ever notice that? 
And Jesus is asking for what doesn't work. Oh, man, this is a, such a mind blower to me. He, he is not only putting an exclamation point on a very real point, but he's also doing what God has always wanted the church to do. Be the place where you can bring out your handicap and have it touched and made whole. Welcome to Rescue. See, we, we accept you, regardless where you came from. We, we, we even accept you when you're weird. You know, we, we welcome the weird. You know, we're not, we're not swinging for the fences here on the social strata. I don't, I don't put an ad in Forbes magazine, come to Refuge Christian Fellowship. We don't, we don't do that. We, we, we just want anybody and everybody that that needs love and connection and understanding to come. And so here we are. Howard, how are you going to end this? I mean, what an amazing time, but how do you end this? I'm going to end this like Jesus would have us end this. There's something about you that's handicapped that's deficient. And, and only you know what that is. It was easy for him because he just, it was his hand, his hand was withered. But you know, I, I really believe this with all my heart. Sometimes the most debilitating handicaps are the ones that nobody can see. Or the ones that nobody, nobody knows about. And those are the ones that we hide. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we don't talk about it, we don't bring it out. But, but I, would be, I would be accused of malpractice if Jesus looked at you from the top of the cross and I can almost hear Jesus say, Howard, you need to ask him. Howard, Howard tell him. Tell him that I'm still here and ready to heal. Tell him. Don't give him another rule. Give him the relationship. Because in, in his touch, all things are made new. So there you are. And now this morning, I'm telling you, stretch forth that hand. How do you do that? Well, you just stand up right where you are and you go, yeah. Jesus isn't trying to make an example of you. He's trying to make a friend with you. He doesn't want to ruin you. He wants to heal you. Oh, God, we're here this morning. And we can celebrate the truth. And we can agree with the rules. But the truth and the rules don't do anything without a relationship with you and you hung on a cross and you you gave yourself up and sacrificed yourself that we might be whole and that we might be back in relationship with you and so we stand this morning yeah handicapped that's why we stand yeah we're we we have sin and we have sickness and we just fall so far short god touch each and every one in this room this morning and heal. Lord, may their lives be an example of the relationship that you have with them, not an expression of the rules that have been laid down for thousands of years. No, no, no. That their lives would be a relationship expression, a revelation of what it means to have a friend in you. And so, God, Lord, touch that which is broken, that doesn't work right, that needs grace and healing. And, Lord, fill your house with these uncontrollable people. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you guys. God bless you. If I don't see you Tuesday, I'll see you next week. Go with God.